Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to call City Council meeting to order. We do have regrets from Mayor Matheson, Councillor Clifford, Councillor Seven, and Councillor Ingram. If I could invite you to join in a moment of silent reflection and perhaps keep in our thoughts the people of Ukraine. Thank you. I'll turn the meeting over to the clerk, Ms. Defoe. The so through you. Good. So through the chair. If you could just give me one moment. Testing. Test, test. Does that sound okay? You're clear here. All right. Uh, so through uh, you, Deputy Mayor Ritzma, uh, item two is declarations of pecuniary interest uh, and general nature thereof. Seeing none. Item three is adoption of the minutes. And there is a motion that the minutes of the regular meeting dated February 28th, 2022, and the special meetings dated March 1st, 2022, and March 7th, 2022, of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Stratford be adopted as printed. Thank you, mover for that, Councillor Bunty and Councillor Beatty. All in favor? Any opposed, if any, and that's carried. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor, item number four is adoption of the addendum to the agenda, and there is an addendum uh, to be adopted. There's a motion uh, that the addendum to the regular agenda of Council and Standing Committees dated March 14th, 2022, uh, be added to the agenda as printed. Thank you. Moved by Councilor Burback, second by Councilor Gaffney. All in favor? Opposed, if any, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Item number five is report of the Committee of the Whole in camera session. And item 5.1, at the March 14th, 2022 session under the Municipal Act as amended, matters concerning the following items were considered. 4.1, update development for future city-owned industrial lands. And that was considered under proposed or pending acquisition or disposal of land by the municipality. And item 5.1, Senior of the Year and Ontario Senior Achievement Award 2022 nominations. And that was considered under personal matters about an identifiable individual including municipal employees or local board employees. Uh, and at the session, uh, direction was provided on both matters. Thank you. Item number six is hearings of deputations and presentations, and there are none scheduled. Item number seven is orders of the day. And item number 7.1 is a resolution, the 2021 Statement of Council Remuneration and Expenses. And there is a staff recommendation that the report titled 2021 Statement of Council Remuneration and Expenses be received for information. A mover for that. Thank you, Councillor Burback. A seconder, Councillor Vasilakos. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor, item 7.2 is a resolution to request to proclaim 2022 as the year of the garden and recognize Saturday, June 18th, 2022 as Garden Day in the City of Stratford. And there is a staff recommendation that Stratford City Council declare its commitment to being a garden-friendly city, supporting the development of its garden culture by endorsing the resolution as noted on your agenda. Moved by Councilor Beatty, seconded by Council Burback. Any discussion, questions, concerns? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, and that's unanimous. Through you, Deputy Mayor, item 7.3 is a resolution, the 2022 Energy and Environment Advisory Committee nomination for the Active Transportation Advisory Committee. And there is a staff recommendation that Felicity Stutcliffe 
be appointed the 2022 Energy and Environment Advisory Committee representative on the Active Transportation Advisory Committee for a one-year term to November 14th, 2022, or until a successor is appointed by Stratford City Council. By Councilor Burbeck, second by Councilor Vasilakos. Thank you. Questions or comments? Call the question, all in favor? Opposed to any, and that's unanimous. Item 7.4 is a resolution for the City of Stratford and Stratford Economic Enterprise Development Corporation Rural Economic Development Program. And that's for the implementation of service delivery improvements for attainable housing development project. And there is a staff recommendation that council authorize the mayor and clerk to sign the contribution agreement between the corporation and the city of Stratford, Stratford Economic Enterprise Development Corporation and Her Majesty the Queen and Right of Ontario as represented by the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs in relation to the implementation of service delivery improvements for attainable housing development project. Mover, moved by Councillor Bunting, seconded by Councillor Henderson. Questions? Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor? Opposed, if any, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 7.5 is correspondence regarding the 2022 New Holland Under-21 Canadian Curling Championship. It is noted that organizers have requested designation of the 2022 New Holland Under-21 Canadian Curling Championship to be held March 25th to April 1st, 2022, as a municipally significant event for the purpose of obtaining a liquor license. Food and beverage service for the event will be held in the upper concession stand and lobby area of the Stratford Brewery Complex. And Huron, Public, Huron Perth Public Health and the Building Division did not identify any concerns with the event. Uh, and there is a motion as listed on your agenda. Thank you. Mover, moved by Councillor Beattie, second by Councillor Burbach. Any discussion, questions or concerns? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed if any, and that's unanimous. Item eight is business for which previous notice has been given and there is none scheduled. Reports of the standing committees is item nine. Item 9.1 is report of the community services committee and there are four items listed. Item 9.1.1, council policy C.1.5, rental of Kiwanis Community Center. Item 9.1.2, advertising on city property policy. Item 9.1.3, cemetery care and maintenance fund increase and item 9.1.4, electronic transit fare program. And there is a motion that the report of the community services committee dated March 14th, 2022 be adopted as printed. Councillor Henderson will move and second by Councillor Beattie. Questions, comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed if any, and that's unanimous, thank you. Item 10 is notice of intent and 10.1 is notice of intent to remove a holding provision. At the March 28, 2022 regular meeting, Stratford City Council will consider removing a holding provision for the land zone mixed use residential MUR-2-H and MUR-3-H21 at 173 Huron Street. This meeting will be held at 7 p.m. through Zoom. Additional details about the application and the removal of the holding provision are available in the attached notice. Thank you. Item 11 is reading of the bylaws. Barton, I had a question about that. Thank you. Sorry, Councilor Anderson, go ahead, please. That's okay. Um, you would have received the email from the gentleman that I assume lives next door. Are the issues that he's having problems with going to be cleared up before that March 28th meeting? And I'll turn that over to the manager of planning. Is, is Uh, through the deputy mayor to Councillor Henderson, certainly staff are aware of the email that you've referenced and we can reach out to the neighbor um, to discuss what the holding provision was for and how it's been addressed. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor Henderson? Thank you. Deputy Clerk. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Item 11 is reading of the bylaws and there are five bylaws listed. 11.1 is to amend fees and charges bylaw 172-2021 to revise certain cemetery fees. 11.2 is to authorize execution of rural economic development program. 11.3 for the levy special charge for the downtown Stratford business improvement area for 2022. 
11.4 to amend appointments bylaw 178-2018 to appoint an energy and environment representative to the active transportation advisory committee and 11.5 to amend delegation of authority bylaw 135-2017 to make a housekeeping amendment and to delegate authority to enter into agreements for advertisement on city property and all of these bylaws can be taken collectively upon unanimous vote of council present. Thank you. A mover to take 11.1 .1 to 11.5 collectively. Thank you, Councillor Burback. Second by Councillor Bunting. All in favor? And that's unanimous. So a, a mover for taking bylaws 11.1 .1 to 11.5, uh, first and second time. Thank you, Councillor Henderson, and second by Councillor Beatty. All in favor? Opposed of any, and that's unanimous. And third and final, Councillor Gaffney and Councillor Burback. All in favor? Opposed of any, and that's unanimous. Through you, Deputy Mayor, item number 12 is the consent agenda. Are there any items listed on the consent agenda to be considered? Seeing none. Item number 13 is new business. Councillor Henderson, I see your hand. Just a minute, I'm trying to find it, sorry. That's okay, take your time. Um, um, CA 2022034, the resolution from the town of South Bruce, Pencil regarding um, the MAT tax. Um, I don't think it would hurt for us to endorse that. I don't think it affects us around here, but it sounds like it makes it more of a level playing field for everybody, for all the campgrounds, I mean. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Is there a seconder uh, to support a CA 2022-034? Seconder for that. Oh, okay. Seeing none, thank you. Back to you, Deputy Clerk. Through you, Deputy Mayor, item 13 is new business. I see no hands. Item 14 is adjournment to standing committees. And a motion to adjourn and to reconvene after the standing committees, moved by Councillor Vasilakos and second by Councillor Burback. Thank you. All in favor? of any and that's unanimous and we will begin i believe we're moving to and i think our first is we're going to turn it over to infrastructure and councillor vasilakos i believe am i correct in that or it's finance and labor councillor gaffney yes thank you Councillor gaffney the floor is yours I was ready for Councillor Vasilakis to step step up there. She felt she wanted to. Um, I will call to order the meeting of the Finance and Labor Relations Committee. And I have regrets from Mayor Masson and Councillor Clifford, and I will add Councillor Seven and Councillor Ingram to that. Item number two: disclosures of pecuniary pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. See none, we'll move on to item three. Uh, subcommittee minutes are attached uh, for your, for your uh, use. Item four, uh, delegations none scheduled. Item five, report of the Stratford Economic Enterprise Development Corporation, CEDCO. Uh, 5.1, Stratford Economic Enterprise Development Corporation, CEDCO Invest Stratford. Update October 1st to December 31st, 2021. <clears throat> I get a mover and seconder, uh, Deputy Mayor Ritzman and Councillor Bunting. Uh, any questions? Councillor Burback. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the report. Um, I just had a question about the um, ongoing investment opportunities uh, for startup businesses. I think that's a really great program. And I'm just wondering, 
uh, how that might be advertised to people, or if we could get maybe a little bit more explanation for people, how they might be able to, to um, get in, get, take part in that funding if they have a small business that they're wanting to start. Ms. Gerber, are you there? Uh, yes, thank you, I'm here. Um, thank you for that question. And through the chair, uh, Starter Company um, is, a two, is, is two cohorts a year. And the, the final cohort for year ending March, 2022, just wrapped up a week ago. So eight new businesses. The next one will will kick off it likely in the fall, Councillor Burbach. So we'll make sure that all members of council have those press releases. We use our social media platforms. Um, we've we've recently started doing some increased work with the local radio stations. So all of that um, will be included. We also uh, um, try to amplify the stories of the startup companies as a way to promote um, getting into it. I'll quickly plug Summer Company while I have you since you've asked about grants. And that's our youth employment or sorry, youth entrepreneurship program, which is open now for applicants. So young people between the ages of 15 and 29 that want to start a business through the summer, that grant is $3,000 for to help offset any of their startup fees and, uh, and put a bit of extra money in their pockets over and above all of their revenues through the year. So thanks for that opportunity. And that was a great question. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Gerber. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else? If not, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed to any, and that's carried. Item six, report of the Director of Corporate Services. Uh, item 6.1, 2022 Ontario Regulation 284-09, excluded expenses. I can move for that uh, item. Councillor Vasilakos and Councillor Burback. Does anyone have any questions? See none, I will call the question. All those in favor? Opposed to Betty, and that's carried. Item 6.2, development charges deferral, payment plan, and rate freeze interest rates. Could I get a mover and seconder for this item? Moved by Councillor Beatty, second by Councillor Vasilakos. Does anyone have any questions or concerns? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Most of any, and that's carried. Uh, item 6.3, reserve and reserve fund reviews. <sighs> I get a mover on the subcommittee's recommendation. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ritzman, Councillor Bunty. Um, any questions for the director? Councillor Anderson. Could you just walk us through the home ownership loans, please? I'm uh, sure that people in the audience would love to know. Madam Director. I actually, I don't know if the Director of Social Services would have anything to add to this, but I am not intimate with this particular program. This is one where we have um, provided an, uh, an opportunity for people who are purchasing a home to borrow the, or to have, have borrow the down payment and have it uh, granted over a period of time. So um, the, the criteria of the program, I believe, is restricted and has caps on it. And so unfortunately, given our current market, uh, with real estate prices and things like that. I think the uptake is pretty limited at the moment. Um, that said, we still have several uh, balances outstanding for that program. So um, it is still in place and it's still a, a something we can utilize, but given the, given the um, I'll say the, the limits on it um, for, with respect to the amount, um, people like that, it's just, it's just not really feasible in this, in this real estate market. I just wanted to uh, raise awareness about it. I know it's on our city website, but just did you, did you I'm want, not sure how people find out. Do you want to it. add something, Ms. McElroy? Uh, through the chair, yes. I, I would just like to add uh, that it is, uh, the criteria is on the city website, and I encourage people to review it, uh, To and it is uh, presented to the social services office. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed to Betty, and that's carried. Uh, item seven, report of Festival Hydro Services, Inc. and Festival Hydro, Inc. Uh, 
Festival Hydro Inc. Uh, there's a subcommittee recommendation. Moved by Councilor Bunting, seconded by Councilor uh, Deputy Mayor Ritzma. Uh, any questions? I don't see anybody here from Festival Hydro, so. Uh, see none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed to say, that's carried. Item eight, for information and committee, 8.1 advisory committees and outside boards, and we have a Stratford's of the World uh, Advisory Committee minutes attached. Item nine, adjournment. Moved by Councilor Verbeck, seconded by Councilor Henderson. All those in favor? Opposed to pay, and that's carried. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So I will call the Infrastructure, Transportation and Safety Committee to order. We do have regrets from Mayor Matson, Councillor Clifford, Councillor Ingram, and um, Councillor Seven. Uh, item number two is disclosures of pecuniary interest. Are there any disclosures and the general nature thereof? Seeing none, item number three is subcommittee minutes. They are there um, to give you an idea of the conversation that happened at subcommittee around these items. Item number four is delegations and we have none scheduled. Item number five is report of the manager of environmental services. And there are two items. Item 5.1 is the drinking water quality management standard 2021 infrastructure review. And um, the report was um, in, in your agenda. And um, there is a subcommittee recommendation there. Moved by Councillor Gaffney, seconded by Councillor Burbeck. Any comments or questions on that item? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed if any, and that's carried. And item number 5.2 is a different but related item, which is the Drinking Water Quality Management Standard 2021 Management Review. And there is a subcommittee recommendation there. Moved by um, Deputy Mayor Ritzma, seconded by Councillor Burbeck. Comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed if any, and that's carried. And then item number six is for the information of the committee. And um, item 6.2 is, uh, 6.1 is the capital project update. 6.2 is the advisory committee and outside board minutes that are there for you to review as you wish. And item number seven is adjournment. Moved by Councillor Bunting, seconded by Councillor Burbeck. All in favor? Opposed, if any, and that's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to call to order the Planning and Heritage Committee. We have regrets from Mayor Matheson, Councillor Clifford, Councillor Seven, and Councillor Ingram. Item number two, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof? Seeing none. Item three, there are subcommittee minutes available for you to review from March the 3rd. Item number four, delegations. There's one delegation that'll be part of item 6.2, which was part of the addendum for tonight's meeting. Item five, report of the Director of Infrastructure and Development Services. And I'd invite Director Crinklaw if he'd like to make a presentation at this time. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so today, I uh, bring back the uh, proposed new development charges bylaw. Uh, this is statutorily required every five years. Um, this by our current bylaw expires April 10th, uh, 2022. So we need to have something in place by that point. So that way, uh, um, we can address it. Uh, really, the report that's brought forward to you is in response to the public meeting that we had uh, on March 1st. Um, a lot of the content that was uh, brought forward at that meeting, as well as uh, um, information and questions we had since that time, is included in this report in detail. Uh, the proposed draft bylaw, as it stands, is very similar to what was proposed in 2017. Um, two things have changed since that time. But I'll just note, uh, the first thing is that housing services are now included to be eligible as part of our, our DC update. Uh, and the opposite, that parking services is now ineligible to be funded through DCs. Um, 
So there's two main topics that were repeatedly talked throughout this uh, this process that I'll just raise. And, and if there's any questions afterwards regarding um, some of the other points, please bring them up at time. Uh, the first question was, uh, is there sufficient justification to fund uh, housing services uh, through DCs? Um, based on service standards for the past 10 years, the city has justification to entirely recover planned uh, housing developments for the next five years and beyond. So we, we definitely have support and reasoning to justify what is being proposed, um, but it's up to council to, uh, to confirm they would like to proceed that way. And the second item that I'll bring up is in relation to in industrial uh, development charges. Um, uh, based on a qualitative review uh, done by staff and the consultants, I'd just like to note that we think that uh, development charges uh, recoverables is occurring at a reasonable rate at this time. Uh, we do have some hesitations about implementing industrial DCs, as outlined in detail in the report. Uh, the two main things I'll just bring up now is that um, most of the infrastructure growth that is currently occurring is in uh, residential and commercial areas um, where DCs are being applied at this time. Um, the other concern or hesitation we have is that um, there is a provincially legislated mandatory exemption for industrial expansions for up to 50% of uh, development growth. Um, this is where a lot of the growth is currently happening in Stratford at this time. Um, this could result in a lack of DC funds being uh, collected at a time where we need funds uh, to support infrastructure growth uh, in the future. So it, it's uh, a bit of a tricky situation, making sure you have sufficient funds uh, needed to address uh, where infrastructure is needed to be installed at this time. Um, if council would like to consider implementing um, industrial development charges, it is not a problem. Um, we would just require additional study. Uh, this could occur in the next year, um, right after passing the proposed draft bylaw. Uh, the first step would be to consider uh, conducting a sensitivity analysis. Uh, this would just help us figure out uh, what the impacts could be and uh, what would be required to transition to a new program. Um, and uh, that's that's a bit of a summary of uh, a highlight of the report. Um, I myself is available. Uh, Director of Corporate Services Carmen Kruger is available for questions, as well as our consultants uh, Watson's economist. And so, you have any questions? Thank you, and and once again, thank you for your to you and your staff for the work on this report. So questions, Councillor Vasilakos, I see your hand and then Councillor Gaffney. Yeah, I was just, um, I, the, I was asking about the industrial um, DCs and uh, I know there's an op optional recommendation there. We don't have to, I, I can make that optional recommendation at a future date once I actually sort of wrap my head around some of the information that's involved and do a little bit more thinking around it. So uh, this isn't the, again, this isn't the only time we can, we can do this. I can bring it up at a future finance and labor relations committee meeting, because I would like a little bit more time to think about, you know, whether we want to commit, you know, staff time and everything else this year to that simply because we do have some, some uh, capacity challenges. So that's true, right? I'm seeing a lot of heads doing this, so I'm good. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Basilakos. Uh, Councillor Gaffney. I was going to make the staff recommendation, and uh, I, I agree with Kathy. I think there should be uh, moving forward some more discussion on uh, on DC charges and some other areas too. Whether we do anything with it, I think it's worth the discussion. Thank you. So, Councillor Gaffney has moved the staff recommendation. A seconder for that. Thank you, Councilor Vasilakos. So the staff recommendation that Council adopt the development charges background study report dated February the 4th, 2022. The Council adopt the proposed development charges bylaw as presented at April 6, 2022 Council meeting and that Council repeal the previous development charges bylaw 45-2017 and any amendments to the bylaw effective upon the proposed development charges bylaw coming into effect. That's been moved and seconded. I will call the question all in favor. Opposed if any, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Moving down to item 6.1 or number six, report of the man, uh, manager of planning. And I would invite Mr. Bannon 
to make a staff presentation with regards to the planning report zone change amendment Z10 21 with the address of 3202 Vivian Line 37. Mr. Bannon, are you available? I am. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your screen. The zone change application Z10 21 was submitted by Zelenka Priamo Limited on behalf of Vivian North Limited. Following the public meeting that was held on September 30th, 2021, the applicant submitted a revised application. The intent was to meet the upper 10 foot. It's hard to hear you. Okay, Mr. Bannon, uh, yeah, we're having some challenges with your audio. Okay, do you hear, can you hear me at all or just? Yeah, it's a bit muffled. A bit muffled, okay. I'll try to speak up a little bit and I'll talk a little slower. Um, so Thank the applicant, Okay. The applicant has revised their application to meet the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority setback requirements, which resulted in a reduction of three parking spaces and a change in the residential zone being requested. The purpose, the purpose of the revised applications is to rezone the subject lands from what is now an urban reserve, UR zone, and an agricultural A-1 zone to a residential fifth density, R5 bracket 1, Special zone, which would be to reduce the minimum required parking spaces for 64 apartment dwelling units from 96 to 93 parking spaces. The application was deemed complete in July of 2021. The applicant has submitted a planning justification report, functional servicing report, archaeological assessment, and a phase one and phase two environmental site assessment. The subject property is located on the north side of Vivian Line 37 between Mill Street North and Morrington Street. The subject lands were formerly used as a commercial garden center and are currently zoned urban reserve UR and E 1 agricultural in the city's zoning bylaw. The proposed zone change amendment promotes efficient development patterns with its range and mix of housing types within the city. And this development would provide an intensification of the site that is near the right, which utilizes existing municipal infrastructure. There is a minimum intensification. Can you pull your computer closer to your mouth or something? Because it's really garbled. Yeah, I have a, a headphones on. I think my laptop that I'm using is position for distribution laptop. And I'm not sure if I can get it any louder, unfortunately. The OP contains a minimum intensification target specified 25% of all new residential growth that is to occur within the built environment. Can we just pause for a minute, uh, Mr. Bannon, just uh, in case um, I'm not sure whether the clerk or the deputy clerk would have any suggestions with regards to the clarity of the presentation? Certainly. Just a, a comment, if I could, Mr. Bannon, uh, two pieces. One, uh, ensure that you're talking into the microphone and also maybe keeping your, your head as still as possible as you, uh, as you speak. So why don't we try that again? Okay, I will try to, to do that. So the official plan contains a minimum intensification target that specifies 25% of the new residential growth is to occur within the built up area between 2013 and 2033. This development would contribute to the achievement of that target. The city's existing water and wastewater services, sufficient capacity to accommodate the development, which would create additional housing supply in the city that is in a form that supports the provision of a range of housing options for a diverse workforce. The official plan doesn't mean we've completely lost your audio, Mr. Bannon. Okay. Not sure why that clicked off. Okay. Uh, the, the, the official plan subject lands are designated as residential area and are within the Upper Thames River Conservation Regulation limit. The requested R5 bracket one zone would have a maximum height of 12 meters a density of 55 units per hectare. And the concept that was submitted would comply with the proposed zone 
as it shows a density of 43 units per hectare with a building height of 10 meters. The subject applications conform with the community design strategy in the official plan. They provide a new form of housing that contributes to a mix of land uses in the area. It respects the natural, natural heritage and hydrological features in the official plan because it does now incorporate a six meter development setback from the top of bank of the floodplain. The concept plan shows parking areas located to the back section of the development, which contributes to maintaining an, an attractive streetscape. And the development is in scale with the surrounding title. The applicant is proposing to change the, the zoning to a residential density, which would allow a minimum of 93 parking spaces for apartment zone units. They've asked for a reduction of three parking spaces for the development. And the reduction is not expected to contribute to the option parking in the area or impact the street streetscape. We've received comments back from the circulation. Canada Post has noted that community mailboxes or a centralized lot box assembly will be implemented. There are no concerns for engineering or community services. And building services has noted that a rental site condition is required. That has been completed. Upper Thames has revised their comments from the original submission, and they note that the revised concept plan and modeling now support, or they are now supportive of it as a revised plan shows a six meter buffer from the top of the bank and the slope. For public comments, we've had uh, four main issues that have been raised. The first comment is a request that the concept plan remains unchanged after the zone change has been approved. Staff can comment on that and state that the submitted concept plan with the rezoning application has been submitted. A detailed design will be completed through the site plan process. And there may be some changes to the design that are required to accommodate proper site planning. The final site plan will comply with the approved zone change or another rezoning of the, of the property may be required. One of the residents also asked to retain the possible tree and make sure that it's undisturbed. The applicant has confirmed the tree is located on the adjacent property, so they will ensure the tree measurement Tree protection measures will be provided through the site plan approval process. There's been a request for a privacy fence along the west property line. That zoning bylaw requires that a plant construct with a minimum height of 1.5 meters is provided next to lands that are zoned residential. The plant construct can be in the form of either a fence or a landscape buffer. And finally, the last comment was a concern with the amount of noise. <laughs> The city's noise bylaw prohibits operation of equipment in conjunction with the construction from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. from Monday to Saturday and all day Sunday and on statutory holidays. So there is a recommendation in front of you from planning. The zoning bylaw amendment consistent with the proposed policy statement conforms with the official plan and the intent of the zoning bylaw and is consistent with the city's strategic policies and representative I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bannon. Just waiting for you to unshare. There we go. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Bannon from council. Seeing none, um, there is a motion to hear uh, the delegation of Dave Hannon from Zelinka Priamo Limited regarding the zone change amendment Z. 10-21 to the address of 3202 Vivian line 37 for Mr. Hammond to be heard. Move for that. Thank you, Councillor Vasilakos and second by Council Burback. All in favor? Opposed to Venice and that's carried. Dave, are you available there? I am indeed. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you very much. Go right ahead. Excellent. Um, so um, good evening, Deputy Mayor, members of council uh, committee. Um, my name is Dave Hannum. I'm a senior associate and registered professional planner with Zelinka Priamo, a London-based planning consultancy. Um, I'm also have the pleasure of being a, a resident of Stratford as well. Um, we're the planning consultants for Vivian North Limited, uh, 
which is an operating comp company of high construction for this rezoning app and, and which comprises the introduction of uh, a department de development on these generally vacant lands. Now, we've carefully reviewed staff's report and the draft zoning bylaw and are pleased to see that they are recommending that planning committee approves the application. Now, we are hopeful of receiving a positive endorsement from committee tonight. Uh, Mr. Bannon uh, provided a synopsis of the project. I've prepared a short visual presentation. I won't go over too much more of the detail, but I'd like to take a few minutes just to highlighting some of the aspects of the proposed development. So um, if you could kindly uh, move to the next slide, please. So from a conce con conceptual, uh, sorry, contextual aerial perspective, uh, as you'll know, there's a variety of established and emerging residential uses and built forms and, and building heights in the area surrounding the subject lands. Um, in terms of surrounding land uses, there's, there's a mix of uses. So recently constructed and under construction, similar residential developments, such as proposed. Uh, residential uses, including apartments and single family homes, uh, public parks and uh, parkettes and also agricultural and, and rural related uses with some commercial uh, uses to the north. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a Google Street image from the front of the site. Um, the, the two existing access points will be consolidated into one driveway and provided generally as shown on the left hand side of the image to avoid the existing hydro pole. Uh, the view of the site's frontage will remain generally unchanged. It's the intention of the developer to retain and enhance existing trees and soft areas of landscaping where possible. Uh, any trees on neighboring properties, and, and in particular, the neighboring property to the left of that screen, uh, who made comments through the public review process for the protection of his poplar tree. Uh, that tree and uh, any other trees that are uh, to be retained will be protected uh, during construction. Um, also, the, the retention and enhancement of this frontage area will improve the streetscape, um, but it'll also provide a, a suitable buffer for future residents uh, from any road noise generated along Vivian Line. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a, a, a snapshot of the concept plan. Um, as Mr. Bannon alluded to, following feedback from the Conservation Authority, and their request to provide a six meter setback along the northerly and westerly property lines, which is, is shown in a, a red hatched line on the drawing. Uh, considerable efforts have been taken to, to maximize setback distances with buildings and, and internal road placement and orientation, all focused towards the center of the site and away from the surrounding properties in Vivian line. Uh, the proposal, as indicated, is conceptual at this stage and will be further refined through the, the site plan process. But just talking through some of the key site stats, um, in terms of the, the number of units and the proposed density, they fit within the uh, prescribed ranges in the official plan. Maximum height is going to be two stories. Now, we, due to the reshuffling because of the Conservation Authority setbacks, we, we ended up losing three spaces. They, they may, and through detailed design, we may recapture those again. Um, and um, so we're just shy of the 1.5 meter per, 1.5 spaces per unit. Um, we have made provision for barrier free spaces uh, near the entrances of the buildings. Um, and also in, uh, in, in front of the actual barrier free units themselves, there is also the ability to be able to provide uh, barrier-free uh, surface parking spaces for residents and, and for visitors as well. Uh, the internal roads meet the municipal standards um, and uh, all of the, the units at first and second floor will provide uh, their own private amenity space that will also be centrally located in peripheral landscaped communis, commun communal areas. Um, and also buffer and landscaping and planting and fencing as well. Um, there, is a, there is a requested um, land dedication along the frontage of just under five meters, uh, which is shown on the plan. Uh, in terms of the units themselves, uh, they're gonna be one to two beds ranging from 800 to 1300 square feet. 
some will be split level between basement and main, some main and loft. Um, and as I indicated, the the the, um, the units on the main floor will be designed to, as barrier free. At this stage, is, there's no specific target demographic earmark for these units. Uh, in terms of price range, they're going to be sold at market rates, and, and as you'll know, they are comparable to the the approved residential developments um, to the east and to the southeast as well. Um, next slide, please. So just highlighting some of the key considerations, uh, obviously the, the application was supported by a number of technical reports, uh, confirming there's no environmental concerns on the site um, or archeological concerns. Um, the site can be ad adequately serviced by municipal services and, and is gonna meet the, the relevant uh, stormwater management quality and quantity control measures for the city and the conservation authority. Uh, I just wanted to highlight again, you know, in terms of the, the parking, we've distributed the barrier-free spaces in front of the building and in front of the, the ground floor barrier-free units. Parking layer is capable of, of providing barrier-free and standard parking for visitors as well. And just re-emphasizing a, a tree assessment and protection plan is being prepared as part of the SPA submission and any trees on neighboring properties that need to be retained will be appropriately protected. Next slide, please. Just in conclusions, from a, from a policy point of view, the, the proposed development is supported by all levels of current and emerging uh, land use planning policies, which encourage residential intensification and location such as this uh, subject lands and they added at the density proposed. Uh, the site has excellent access as it fronts on to Vivian and, uh, and opposite Romeo, which are collector roads, um, a, a high quality residential development will be created on these currently underutilized lands, um, which are consistent with the, with the surrounding land uses without any significant undue impacts. Um, and as indicated, this, the application is supported by a number of technical reports. Um, it, it is, it, it, these, the zoning bylaw is conceptual at this stage and will be subject to further refinement through the, the SPA application process. Um, which will look at matters such as lighting and fencing and landscaping, snow storage. We have no reason to believe that the site can't be designed and isn't capable of accommodating any of these re requisite facets. Um, and th then they'll be looked at in, uh, in, in considerable detail through the SPA process. Mm -hmm. um, next slide. So, so that, that concludes um, my presentation, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. And at this point, or as directed, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Councillor Henderson, go ahead. I have a few things. I noticed you said that the driveway coming in would be on the left side of that um, telephone pole. Is there any way it could be on the right side? Because I'm just thinking that's an empty spot there. And on the left side, it's right beside a residential home. And there'll be, you know, people coming and going. I'm just wondering if there's a possibility of having it come in on the right side, consideration for that. And so then my next part is, I see that you have, I think it's eight barrier-free parking spots. I'm, I'm just concerned sometimes when builders build it, they put the ramp down further or whatever, but it's nice if you can have in front of the parking spot that it's, you know, flat. And actually what's really nice is if you can build the whole length of it sort of flat or rolled so that if any of the other units have somebody come to visit you know they're able to get into the place quite easily and having said that i'm wondering if most of these units are not going to have steps going into them um that they're going to be you know completely accessible that way I mean, I know some of them probably have second floors, but even if somebody can get in on the first floor type thing, you know, and and speaking about accessibility, I, I know we're probably not at that stage yet, but are, when you're looking at accessible units, are you looking at the type that actually you can roll right under the sink and, you know, come up to your stove and um, be able to wheel into the shower type thing and and the handles that are more push-pull rather than turn, so it's easier to use and things like that. And then my last sort of part is about um, energy efficient. I don't know if you heard that there was um, 
a presentation, I think it's Reed Company is going to be building homes to the net zero standard. So is there any thought to that? And that's sort of basically all the questions I had. Mr. Hannum? Sure, I've just made a note. So I'll go through, um, in terms of the barrier-free um, comments, with regards to providing flat uh, access in front of the, the spaces, uh, obviously we can look at that through the SBA process. I have no reason to believe that we can't accommodate um, that, that particular issue. Uh, and certainly for um, the, I think there's with the larger buildings where there's 14 units, there's four units at directly at grade. I have no reason to believe that we, we would need to put steps into those units either. And the, the units are of a size that are capable of being designed um, subject to, you know, uh, future occupier requirements to, to meet the, the relevant barrier free aspects uh, in, internal of the units as well. Um, from the driveway perspective, we look to consolidate the driveways on the left hand side because there is uh, a run of trees on the right hand side uh, that we were looking to retain. Also, as a byproduct of our discussions with the Upper Thames uh, River Con Conservation Authority, we had to remodel our, our stormwater management. Um, and along that right hand side of that access is actually a, a stormwater management facility, uh, a dry pond. So we, we have to shift our access to the left hand side. Um, from a, we've been in communications with the neighbor on, the, uh, on that side with the poplar. Uh, his main concern was the preservation of that because there's an existing driveway there that's already uh, compacted a lot of that uh, root system. There's gonna be no impact to that tree. Uh, there is discussions between the two landowners about possibly providing some improved fencing along there. Um, but in terms of that, we did look at a number of options, but the, the, the access on the left-hand side is, is deemed to be the most efficient from a site design perspective. Um, from an energy efficiency perspective, uh, we would meet the, the requirements uh, put forward to us. I don't think we're looking at anything beyond that at this point in time. I know I, I listened to that read perspective as well. Certainly um, when you're looking to implement those sorts of those types of measures in certain products um, and, and the, it becomes a lot more tricky to, to implement them with respect to apartment buildings compared to the townhouses that they were they were looking to bring into. I'm not saying that that's something that can't be considered at this point in time, but it wouldn't specifically be a selling point uh, for this development. Thank you, Mr. Hannell. Any further questions, Council Burback? Thank you. Um, in regards to the stormwater management, uh, it is a bit concerning that it is in the floodplain. And I know you've talked to the Upper Thames River uh, Conservation Authority already. Um, I'm just curious, is there anything like permeable pavement or um, the low, you know, low impact design considered for the sort of the parking lot areas of this development? Um, I, I'm sure there will be as part of the, the SPA application. Obviously, there is a considerable amount of peripheral green space around this site and in and between the buildings as well. Um, we haven't got to that level of detail with regards to the, the you know, the permeability of, of surfaces. But um, uh, in terms of the stormwater management, it, it has been looked at in nauseating detail by the Conservation Authority and also MTE, and it'll be thoroughly reviewed through the SPA application. So um, if, if there is a requirement to include or introduce additional permeable surfaces, then I'm sure we'll hear about it through that review. Great, Any thank you. Further? Okay. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Hannum. Thanks. Okay. So moving forward then, there is a staff recommendation that the application Z10-21 uh, to amend the zoning on 3202 Vivian Line 37 from future residential FR zone and agricultural uh, A-17 zone to residential fifth density R5 with site specific uh, regulations be approved for the following reasons. The request is consistent with the provincial policy statement. 
The request is in conformity with the goals, objectives, and policies of the official plan. The official plan amendment and zone change will provide for a development that is appropriate for the lands. And the public was consulted during the application circulation. Comments that have been received in writing or at the public meeting have been reviewed, considered, and analyzed within the planning report. And that council passed a resolution that no further notice is required under section 34 bracket 17 of the Planning Act. Mover, thank you, Councillor Gaffney, a seconder for that. Thank you, Councillor Beatty. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Moving down to item 6.2, heritage alteration permit application for 265 St. David Street and is the manager, Ms. Bridge, available for making a presentation? Ms. Bridge? Thank you through the chair. Um, I don't have a formal presentation for you, but I can give you some brief oral remarks on their report and their staff recommendation. Um, so you have before you this evening for consideration a heritage alteration permit for 265 St. David Street. So uh, heritage alteration permits are required when alterations are being made to a building that's designated under Ontario's Heritage Act. Um, 265 St. David was designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act in October of 2020. Um, among the specific heritage attributes that are listed in the designation bylaw for this property is a second story opening that contains a pair of single entrance doors. Uh, so in January of this year, the owner removed the existing doors from the second story of 265 St. David and replaced them with windows. Uh, this work was completed without a heritage alteration permit. Uh, in the management report, there are photos of the building uh, before and after the alteration. Uh, when staff were made aware of the changes, they reached out to the property owner and advised them that the work that they had undertaken required a permit. Um, and they subsequently applied for it. Uh, so as per our normal practice, once they applied for the heritage alteration permit that was reviewed by Heritage Stratford. Um, heritage Stratford recommended refusal of the permit as the alterations didn't comply with the heritage attributes that are listed in the designation bylaw. Um, so typically when, a, when Heritage Stratford recommends refusal of a permit, uh, staff try to facilitate a discussion between Heritage Stratford and the property owner. Um, in this case, the property owner declined to meet. Um, so staff have identified a few options in the management report, but have recommended that the heritage alteration permit be refused and that the owner be directed to remove the windows and replace them with doors that match the original doors in terms of shape, color, pattern, and material. Um, I'd be pleased to take any questions that uh, the committee has at this time. I see Councillor Henderson, go ahead, please. Um, I'm wondering when Heritage Stratford was reviewing this, did they have the picture that was sent to us today showing the shape and what it looked like? I took a drive by and I'm, I'm trying to understand why they, you know, obviously not applying for a heritage permit first is wrong and should have been well known because of how long it took for this to get through council to begin with. But um, I'm wondering, is it, if, if the person is, I, I know when the lady was speaking, I watched the, the subcommittee meeting, she was speaking about safety, et cetera. And I know you can make doors so that, you know, you can't make them. Is, is it possible that it could be windows that are shaped like that instead? And, I looked at the windows from, what was it, 1910, before the balcony was there. Now the balcony has been removed and it sounds like they were trying to go back to that shape. I guess what I'm wondering is, did Stratford Heritage see those pictures and would that affect, you know, how they're looking at it? I just wonder if a uh, deferral back to um, Stratford Heritage to have a look at that. Ms. Bridge? Uh, through the chair. So I do not believe that Heritage Stratford had the, uh, the photo that was provided to council from the property owner today. They would have the um, record of designation in the designation bylaw, which documented the heritage attributes. And they also had the uh, photos showing the changes that had been made. Thank you. 
Councilor Basilakos. Um, I was going to say though that 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 photograph was shown to us at the subcommittee meeting, and the chair of Heritage Stratford was present at that meeting and was aware of it and and spoke to it. And so um, I, I suspect that they would have been aware of the conversation that was had. Thank you, Councillor Basilakos. Councillor Henderson. And then Councillor Vasilakis. I would like to defer this back to the Heritage Committee. And my understanding is um, the owner of the property couldn't or wouldn't be at the meeting and see if it's possible to set up a meeting to arrange what type or how the changes could be, you know, and, and going forward. Like, that's just my motion. So there is a deferral motion, a seconder for that deferral motion. Seeing none, Councillor Vasilakos, I saw your hand. Go ahead, please. Um, I was going to, were we going to hear from someone before we go ahead? Yes, we are. So if you could hold that, then that would be great. Thank you. Any further questions for the manager of planning with regards to this piece? Councillor Bunting, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I, I'm not so sure that if, uh, if she knows this or not, but uh, I'd ask at the subcommittee meeting if um, if anybody knew where the doors went to, like, are they still around or have they magically disappeared? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Bunting, uh, staff are not aware as to whether they have uh, retained the doors or whether they've disposed of them. Uh, certainly, we can reach out to the property owner to see if they'd be willing to share that information. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gaffney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing in reading the report uh, that was pointed out is that the work they've done, they've done in vinyl. Uh, so that makes it uh, a fairly unacceptable move. It's quite, uh, I can, I can, I can uh, safely say that uh, you would have no problem find, finding somebody to build you wood windows if windows were the direction we were gonna go. So that's one of the problems is that they were replaced with vinyl windows. And in 1910, they didn't have vinyl windows. And I guess I have a question for staff. Uh, the designation that was put on this uh, particular property was requested by the owner, was it not? Back when all the all the discussions were going on with this owner. Thank you, Councillor Gaffney. Ms. Bridge. Uh, through the chair, it's my understanding that yes, the designation was done with the consent of the owner. Um, I don't know if it was a, a direct request from them or a request that came as a result of other development applications that were um, applied for on the property at the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Councillor Henderson. Well, now I'm curious. I wonder if all the other windows are done with vinyl. Because weren't they all replaced? Because they all look the same material when I drove by. Councillor Gaffney, I see your hand. Uh, that I don't know if the other windows are an issue, but these windows in particular were part of the designation. Uh, so that's it. That's I think that's really one of the points here is those windows in particular were referred to in the designation itself. Thank you. I think what we'll do is, as per the addendum, there is a motion uh, that the delegation of Patrick O'Rourke uh, regarding the heritage alteration, alteration permit application for 265 St. David Street be heard. So we're moving for that. Thank you, Councillor Bunting, and second by Councillor Burback. All in favor? And that's carried. And I'm just looking to the deputy clerk, and we are just connecting with Mr. O'Rourke. And I see you're on the line. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good, good evening. Good evening. I wanted, to, I wanted to thank the committee for agreeing to hear me um, once again. 
regarding 265 St. David. I guess it's, it's fair to say that in the past, um, I've often been critical of staff reports and their recommendations to, to, to you. But in this case, men's staff, both for their report and their presentation. In my opinion, they accurately identify the issues, set out the potential options, and recommend the appropriate action. I urge Council to follow the recommendations of Heritage Stratford, who you appoint to give you advice on heritage matters. Professional staff, who you employ to give you advice on these matters, as well as your subcommittee deny the heritage permit. Uh, a, a further comment that you were just discussing, and that relates to the designation. Subcommittee minutes say the owner's representative claimed they didn't know the property was designated. Um, as Ms. Bridges pointed out, there was a letter from the owner earlier. That letter was related to settlement of another issue, but nonetheless, the owner agreed to and then did write to council, request designation, changing a position he had held for a number of years, and set out the heritage attributes he saw, including the entrance as it was at the time. He also would have received notice of the designation bylaw as part of the whole heritage designation process. I think the clerk or the, the CAO can confirm that. And then somewhat bluntly, the claim, I didn't know I needed a permit, is really one of the lamest excuses I've ever heard. And I think council should simply proceed. And just a final point, staff report notes the owner will be able to appeal. It says no. True. In an appeal, the owner is going to have to convince the tribunal that despite the city's heritage committee and professional staff recommending denial, and despite the fact that the owner himself had asked that these particular features be protected by designation, he should nevertheless be allowed to essentially remove them and replace them with something else. It seems to me that's a pretty steep hill to climb before any tribunal. So in the end, I encourage council to follow this staff's recommendation to deny it. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Mr. O'Rourke. Any further conversation questions from committee? Councillor Gaffney. I'll move the uh, recommendation, Mr. Chair. Seconder for that, Councillor Vasilakos. Further discussion? Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor? Opposed to Benny, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Moving down to item seven, report of the municipal law enforcement officer, 7.1, sign, sign by law variance for the Rotary Club of Stratford. As we know that they're celebrating their 100th anniversary. Um, congratulations to the Rotary Club. There is a subcommittee recommendation. And Councillor Bunting will move that and Councillor Vasilakos will second that. And that recommendation states that the Rotary Club of Stratford be granted a sign variance to erect two fascia signs on the exi existing mounting brackets designated spaces on City Hall for the month of May for the their 100th anniversary activities provided the Rotary of Club of Stratford obtains a sign permit and pays all applicable fees for permits and sign variance applications. Anything further before I call the question? All in favor? Opposed to any, and that's carried. Moving down to item number eight, report of the deputy clerk uh, with regards to 8.1, uh, 2022 outdoor patio program. And there is a staff recommendation 
And Mr. Bantock, I don't know if you want to give any background to this at this time. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so this report's just being brought forward uh, to provide an update uh, on the upcoming 2022 patio season. Um, we've also included uh, intended administrative updates to the 2022 guidelines, uh, and I am available to answer any questions from committee. Thank you very much. I see Councillor Henderson and then Councillor Gaffney. Go ahead, Councillor Henderson. Are we planning to adopt what we did in 2021? And then in 2023, we can look at adding fees, like have it free again this year. And then by next year, the businesses should be all back, well, touch wood, <laughs> back in um, full mode because it's March. And I've seen some are already starting to set patios up. So it'd be nice for them to know what we're planning to do this year. Deputy Clark. Uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor. So uh, as noted in the report, um, there are uh, fees for the patio program uh, in effect through the approved fees and charges bylaw uh, to set fees for 2022. Uh, those fees for the outdoor cafe license being uh, $619 plus the 265 per square foot. But what about like the boardwalks being put in and stuff like that? Like I just. So through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, there would be no fee to install or remove the boardwalks uh, under this structure, uh, but the business license fees uh, do are currently in effect. Thank you. Councillor Gaffney, I saw your hand. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, um, I thought the fees that we were going to be charging uh, was going to cover the, and maybe I'm reading it wrong, the $18,000 plus the $4,200 to skid proof the things. If that's not true, any fees we get do not cover the expense. Deputy Clerk. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so that is. Uh, true. Uh, any fees that we collect through the business license uh, fees will help to cover those expenses that have been budgeted for. Uh, the $800 that was previously discussed last year in terms of an install and removal fee for the boardwalks, that is not currently in effect. And I... Thank you, Councillor Gaffney. Your uh, yes. Uh... So, our, like, as of March 21st, we're back in business, I understand, like, we be in the province of Ontario, <clears throat> there's not going to be, there's not, no longer going to be any restrictions on uh, seating capacities in existing facilities. Um, I realize that could change, but... Uh, so I, I, I just have some hesitancy about if, if these patio extensions are required this year or wanted this year, there's two things. At the very least, at the very least, the expenses the city incurs incur, incur, should be covered by any fees we collect. The other thing I have some concern about and uh, that the loss of revenue from the actual using the parking spaces for what they're intended to be used used for is going to be lost to us again for another year here. Uh, and the other, and I've mentioned this before, I have some concern about taking all this parking away from downtown for the other businesses in the in the core that don't rely on that don't uh, 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 don't rely like the restaurants rely on people coming in and eating their food, uh, but we also have to show some concern for the other businesses that uh, that aren't being provided this sort of uh, accommodation. So. Deputy Clark, do you want to respond to that? I don't know if there was a question there or a comment, so I'll turn it back to you. Uh, if perhaps uh, through Deputy Mayor, perhaps if Councillor Gaffney could clarify if, if there was a question. 
Yes, there was a question. The question, there's a couple questions in there. Uh, one of them being, are, are the fees we're going to charge for this program going to cover the expenses? Uh, and uh, the, I guess the other question is how, how, and you may not have an answer to this question, but how are we going to make up the, the loss of revenue for parking? Councilor Gaffney, Deputy Clerk. So through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so as with all of uh, business licensing fees, I guess just to um, to use that as an example, um, we put the fees in place in an attempt to get back to cost recovery, but that isn't always the case. Um, based on uh, participants in last year's program, if the same participants participated this year uh, and paid the fees as noted in the fees and charges bylaw, we would recover the fees uh, as noted in the report with respect to the install and delivery and the coding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Further questions, Council Burback. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, the clerk or anybody in the, the clerk's office has been able to reach out to some of the businesses. I think, did you do a survey at the end of last year? Um, just to, uh, to see what the interest level would be for businesses, because I, I'm, this is completely anecdotal, but the businesses that I've talked to really liked the program. And and so did the, the patrons, the people where, where they had an increased um, seating capacity. And uh, coming up, that would probably really help revenues if they were able to uh, serve more people. I also think that people are still feeling uncomfortable in indoor spaces. So being able to provide those additional, out, that additional outdoor seating, I think would really encourage people to come out and, and uh, be patrons at our restaurants. So um, I see it as a very positive program. Uh, which would make up for maybe some of the inconvenience of parking a little bit half a block or a little bit further away. Um, yeah, I think it would be more than made up for uh, by this program. I, I think it's a really great program. But I guess my question is, do you ha have you got any feedback from, from the BIA or the businesses? Thank you, Council President. Deputy Clerk. For you, Deputy Mayor. Staff have been uh, in conversation uh, with the BIA, Destination Stratford, and Invest Stratford, uh, as well as the Chamber, just to receive uh, feedback and comments on the report and uh, the guidelines as proposed. Uh, there is actually a survey that the BIA is drafting to circulate just to gather interest. Um, I don't have that information available today just because it is still uh, being prepared, but I'm hopeful that I may have some information to share uh, on the 28th uh, if this goes through to council, uh, just with respect to um, potential interest in participating this year. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Seeing none, there is a, there is a staff recommendation and that the 2022 outdoor patio guidelines be received and that policy P3.3.3 P3, use the um, use of municipal property, boulevards and sidewalks, section A, use of sidewalks as amended be further amended by the following, by adding the following clause, uh, temporary tents slash canopies, no tents or similar structures are permitted on city property unless approved through the outdoor patio program, special events program, or at the approval of the Director of Infrastructure and Development Services. Temporary tents are exempt in C3 zoning. If they are canopy style, quickly disassembled, safely secured during the day, are less than 10 meters squared, and all components removed every night. I move it for that recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Burback, seconded by Councillor Beatty. Further discussion? Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor? Opposed, if any, and I believe that's unanimous. Thank you. Moving down to item number nine, the rest of the information is for council. Um, and moving to number 10 is the motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Vasilako, second by Councillor Bunting. All in favor? And that's unanimous, and so we're adjourned. Council. 
council reconvene deputy clerk through you deputy mayor item 15.1 is declarations of pecuniary interests uh, and please restate any that remain at standing committee see none item 15.2 is reading of the bylaws uh, there is uh, one bylaw listed that's 11.6 confirmatory bylaw first and second reading thank you councillor henderson and councillor burback all in favor and that's unanimous third and final councillor gaffney and councillor bunting all in favor and that's unanimous and the last item of uh, tonight's meeting is a motion to adjourn moved by councillor back and second by councillor b all in favor and we're adjourned thank you everybody <laughs>